Hi guys, my name is Daryl, and today I'd like to show you the exercises that are in volume two of the Master Series. Now if you're following along these videos and you actually have my book Invincible, um, this would be on page 154. Now if you don't have a copy of Invincible, then you can go to my website at www.darylconnor.com. Now just like volume one, I'm not going to go into detail about the program. I'm not going to talk about reps, sets, cadence, and all, and all the nuances of the program. Um, if you're following along, you can just read it for yourself, and then um, you know these videos will help you understand how to do the exercises a lot better. So volume one was really designed for developing the neuromuscular system. I remember one time going through the program because it, it, it was, you know, you're doing consecutive days and so on, and I, I uh, sort of made the mistake. I, I questioned Vince, and you, you never questioned Vince. <laughs> But I questioned him. I just got it. I, I was I was new. I didn't know, and so uh, that's how Vince was. But um, anyway, so I found, he didn't hang up on me, which was nice. Um, so I um, anyway, so he told me that I wasn't overtraining and that the program was designed correctly because of the fact that it was about building your nervous system, the neuromuscular system. And he said, within the first four weeks, you're not going to see a whole lot of change. It's not about changing your physique in a month. He said, but you're, you're, you're establishing the, uh, the, your, your stress response. You're building your nervous system, which means that you're, when you exercise, that your body's going through stress and that you know, you're building your threshold of stress. And so that's what the first month was all about, is that um, the, the connection, the mind-muscle connection. And you know, when you're exercising and you, you set off that, your sympathetic nervous system response, um, there's a, you know, some people have a very low threshold and so, uh, of stress. And so when the, what happens is when you go through these progressions, and if you're not ready for it, you're going to overtrain very quickly. So volume one was really to, to sort of reset and rebuild the foundational support of the nervous system, especially the sympathetic nervous system, so that you are able to withstand more intensity as the programs uh, develop. And so that's what volume one was all about. Volume two is still a foundational program, and it's a great program. It's one of my favorite programs because that's when I really started to get excited about uh, Vince's stuff. And I, I realized at that point, it was month two, that, I was, that this guy was a genius and that um, I was really uh, lucky to be connected to this guy because it was um, volume two that sort of opened up my, my eyes to new exercises. Um, even though there were a lot of new exercises in volume one, which were fun to do, but volume two, uh, there were great exercises, and I really started to see a, a connection with those exercises, and I was like, wow, this is great. I just remember going to the gym and doing some wild things, and the, and the, the guys that were, that were training at the gym, they would look at me like I was nuts, but I didn't care. You know, I stayed in my zone, I stayed in my, like, in my own little bubble, and it was awesome because I, I had like this little secret, knowing that I had Vince Jerome to help me out, and um, I'd go to the gym, and i just put 100% trust into the program and to Vince and everything, and, and it really worked out. So Volume 2 is a, another great foundational program, and it's one of my favorite programs. And um, you get a, a lot of strength development in Volume 2. You don't see a whole lot of change in your physique yet, but um, in Volume 2, you start to see like this, this strength. And I just remember my, my recoverability was so much better. Like I could go through the, the intensity of the workout, and I would, I would train hard. I would do exactly what I was supposed to do, and I didn't waste time. Vince always said to go to the gym and stay 100% focused. Don't talk to anybody. Don't do anything. Just do your workout and do it exactly the way he wanted it done. And so I did it. You know, I was like right to the, right to the exact letter. And so I just remember going to the gym and just hammering away and, and making every rep count. One thing that, one bit of advice that Vince gave me was you always want to perform every rep like it's the last rep. And that really sat in with me because when I would do exercises before and before I met Vince, you know, you, you kind of go through the motion. You just kind of make, sometimes looking around, you know, and, you know, all this stuff. And, you know, you're totally distracted. There's no connection, you know. But when Vince told me to kind of dial in and to really feel the muscle and to feel the contraction and, and focus on what I was trying to, to accomplish. Like if I'm working bicep, you know, focus just on the bicep and, and make it work as much as you possibly can. And, and when he said that, make every rep like it's his last rep, you know, that really made sense to me. And so I'd make a, you know, a three by eight 
uh, three sets of eight reps, very, very difficult. So by the time I was done with the third set, I was completely exhausted. Where other guys would just go through it, no problem. And that's the way I used to be. But when I started to really focus and put the mind to the, to the muscle connection and really focus on the contraction to make that muscle work the way you want it to work so that the, the exercise doesn't control you, you control the exercise, but you're allowing the muscle to really get that pump and, that, and the blood pump that you're looking for and to make it very, very difficult, every rep counted. And so that's what I loved about Vince's stuff because when I went in for 30 minutes, it was 30 minutes of, of high intensity. And so when I'd go home, I'd be completely exhausted. But then with the diet and the supplements and everything that Vince prescribed for us, then your body would recover. And that's, that's the whole idea. So month one, volume one, allowed you to kind of build that, that foundation on the nervous stress. And then volume two, allow you to kind of have that uh, ad adaptation. So you're, you built the, your sympathetic threshold up a little bit higher. And so that's what volume two is all about. And then it builds on from there. So Vince was a complete genius, and I realized that um, as soon as I got into volume two. And then I knew that this guy was the real deal, and, and so that's when I really started to appreciate what he was talking about and, and his methods. So guys, this is a great program. I hope you enjoy it. And these are the exercises of volume two. All right, so guys, I'm gonna show you the seated short pull. So guys, the first thing you wanna do on this exercise is you want to set the cable at 16 inches. That's the optimal height, and you, that's going to allow you to get the best stretch on this exercise. Um, and also, you want to have something that's going to brace your feet, like you can use an aerobic step, piece of wood, or something that's going to allow you to be braced so you don't, you don't go forward when you do this exercise. Um, the next piece is uh, you want to get one of these straps. <clears throat> these are the leather straps. Um, so Vince had these at his gym, and these work the best. They don't, um, if, you, if you use like the, the tricep rope, and it doesn't work well um, because you actually have to slide your hands into this strap. So what you do is you're going to slide your hand in, and then you're going to grab the, the leather strap. So you slide in. So it's important. This is, a, this is a key point because a lot of people will just grab it like this. It's a totally different exercise if you just grab the handles like this. Um, you really want to put your hand in like this so you can get the, this will support the wrist as well as keep your hands from sliding out. And so what we want to do, so that way you have this, you know, your, your hands aren't um, doing all the work. You're going to be able to focus on the muscle a lot better when your hands are inside the strap than when you grab hold. So I'm not, you don't have to grab like a death grip. It's just kind of loose, loose fingers here. So to get in position, what you do is just kind of put one hand in. And then you would put your other hand in once you're braced onto the, the platform. And then, again, your hands are inside the straps. You see, that's a very important part of the, this exercise. And what you're gonna do, you're gonna keep the knees slightly bent. Now again, you wanna focus on your Therese Major. So if you don't know what the Therese Major is, then I suggest that you look at an anatomy book and, and see where it is and the origin and the insertion because it's gonna help you focus on the exercise a lot more if you actually know where the muscle is. Um, and so what you wanna do is you wanna get down. Now we're gonna keep the elbows up. You're gonna put your head down between your arms and then we're gonna to begin to pull. Now as you pull, you're keeping your elbows up nice and high and don't lock your elbows here. You keep your elbows bent the entire time at the starting position. And then you're gonna exhale, you're gonna pull back, and then you're going to pull, keep your chin on your chest, keep your back rounded out, you're going to concave the chest, you're going to end up into the sides of your ribs, and you're going to inhale as you come back, and then we're going to exhale, so this is what it looks like in real time.
rest. Okay, now, so the key points here when you do this one is that you're starting, the legs are kind of bent. You don't want to keep them completely locked. You want the arms out, so you're bending over, elbows up high, okay, because the Therese Major is right back into this point right here uh, below the, the posterior deltoid. And so we want to keep the elbows up because we want this, this motion as you're pulling, that's what's going to pull on the Therese Major. So we're starting here with the elbows bent, head down between the arms, and you're going to pull, keeping the elbows up, you're going to start to activate the Therese Major, you're going to pull, and you're going to continue to follow that path of resistance all the way through, keeping your chin down onto your chest, round out your back, and then bring the, the straps to the sides of your ribs, right, right below the, the, the chest, so right in there nice and tight, and you keep the elbows up, don't let them drop. So you can come in, you exhale, and so you're ending up in what's called the tug of war position. So it's this position here like this. If you're, you know, if we were doing a tug of war, we'd be in this position pulling. And that's the same thing. So we want to be here and you're pulling here into that, that rounded out back position so that your chest is concaved. And you exhale and you hold it about two or three seconds and then we slowly return. It's a great exercise, again, you have to have the right components for this exercise. It has to be 16 inches high on the cable. You have to use a leather strap to really get the most benefit from the exercise. And then, because otherwise, if you use a regular strap or something else, you're going to hold on too tight to the strap, and you're going to lose the focus on the muscle. So it's going to displace a lot more tension on your forearms than it's actually going to work on the, on the target muscle, which is the Therese Major in this case. So guys, that is the seated short pull otherwise known as the Therese Major short pull. So now guys, I'm going to show you the, the half Gironda dip. Now in volume two, I've only seen this in volume two, and it's the half Gironda dip. All the other volumes and all the other programs that I've ever seen of Vince's talks about the full Gironda dip, which you'll start to see in volume three. Volume one was kind of like the progression to the Gironda dip with the fulcrum push-up. So in volume two, um, Vince prescribes the half Gironda dip. And I believe that it was written like this on purpose so that um, for guys that were still struggling with doing the actual Gironda dip, and so Vince kind of had that progression from the fulcrum push-up to the half Gironda dip, and then eventually into the full Gironda dip. So this is the half Gironda dip that is written in volume two. Now this is the actual Gironda dip bar that was in Vince's gym, and this one's a lot different. Um, if you've never seen it, it's a flared out pattern, so the arms, actually, I mean the, the bar actually flares out, and so it, it accommodates to many different shoulder width people, I guess, um, so shorter people with, or people that had a shorter uh, shoulder width would actually come up a little bit more up the front, and then guys that were really big and wide, like a basketball player or so, would go back here a little bit further. Um, the average guys, like myself, kind of reside right here in the middle. Now the idea is that for me, if you're about 5'9 to 5'10, you want to be about 32 inches apart on your width. And the difference between this bar and the ones that you would see in today's gyms is that the a modern day gym usually has like a parallel bar and it's usually too narrow and it's kind of like designed for like everybody but it has to adjust to different uh, shoulder widths otherwise it it's not going to work so it's not just a one size fits all uh, situation so this bar allows adaptability the modern day gym does not and those parallel bars um, they're not designed correctly for this type of a dip and so you, if you try to do a Gironda dip on a parallel bar that's too narrow, um, you're going to end up hurting your shoulders and hurting yourself in terms of maybe even uh, tearing a pec. But the, uh, it has to be flared out like this, and it makes it much more anatomically um, correct when you do it. So you're going to grab the bar, you're going to drop down, and I'm going to point the toes to the floor, 
So we're gonna be in a crescent position. So you're gonna bring your feet forward, toes pointed with your chin on your chest. So your feet will be underneath your chin. And then we're gonna go down all the way for the stretch. We're gonna do two small little bounces at the end so we can really get a deep stretch. And then we're only gonna come up halfway till the arms are uh, horizontal to the floor. So you're gonna go down. Point your toes, chin on chest. I'm gonna do one, two, and then come up. One, two, one, two, one, two. Exhale as you come up, inhale as you go down. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. And so, <clears throat> key points here, when you're doing the half Girona dip, is you're getting in position, toes are in front of your chin, or underneath your chin, toes are in front of your body, toes are pointing to the floor, keep your chin on your chest, go down, hit two small bounces, and then come up. You're only coming up about three inches. So it's a half a Girona dip, and the idea of this particular exercise is so that it's preparing you to go into the full Gironda dip, which I will demonstrate in volume three. Now, if you're strong enough, and you can actually do, go up all the way without locking your arms or losing your chin position on your chest, that's the full Gironda dip, then you can proceed into that even if you're in on volume two. That's fine, <clears throat> but this idea of building up from the fulcrum push-up to the half Gironda dip is for guys that are still not strong enough to take their body weight into the full extension of the Gironda dip. But if you are, go for it. If you're not, then I want you to stay here, volume two, performing the half Gironda dip, and that's gonna build you up for the full Gironda dip in volume three. Now don't rush it guys, this is, it's a process. So you wanna be able to do these exercises correctly and you don't wanna use bad form. So by just doing the half Gironda dip and even though you might be able to do a, a full Gironda dip, you might not be able to get all the reps. So I would stay at the half Gironda dip. It's very important to do these exercises correctly in the format that is written in all the volumes. So guys, that is the half Gironda dip. Now guys, I wanna show you the seated lateral raise. So you wanna sit at the edge of the bench so you have space between your legs and the bench because you wanna be able to take the dumbbells and place them underneath your legs, touch all four bells together, you're gonna to lean forward and then you're gonna exhale and then raise up. So it looks like this, exhale. And then you're gonna come up to a top position here with your pinkies a little higher than your thumbs. And then you're gonna come back down nice and smooth. Inhale, and then exhale. Raise up, and then lean back, and then lean forward, inhale, and then exhale. And then back down. So this is what it kinda looks like in real time right here. So you're gonna exhale. And so the key points here, say you wanna start with the dumbbells underneath, touch all four bells together. You're gonna to lean forward. You're gonna exhale as you're exhaling, coming up, leaning back until you get to the top position. The top position, your pinkies will be higher than your thumbs. So as you're coming up, as you're ascending, you're gonna come up and you're turning your hands slightly into that top position so that the pinkies will be higher than your thumbs at the top. Then you come back down touch the bells, and then back up. 
and then we're gonna keep the elbows just slightly bent. We're not going straight out, so we're not going like, like that. That's too, too drastic. So we wanna go out, you're gonna keep a slight, just a little bend, and then come up, turn the pinkies up, and then back down. And you exhale, so you're getting up pretty high, so your, your dumbbell will be almost ear height. If you're measuring, you don't wanna be way up here. You don't wanna cause impingement on the shoulder. So you just wanna come up, exhale, activate the delts, and then get off it. Now this is a great exercise. Um, the reason why we lean is that you're catching the contraction at the beginning here. So as you begin the movement, the deltoids activate and then they come up and you pull and then you stay in that contraction for about two seconds at the top and you come back down. So it's a little different variation than just sitting here and going like this. As you'll see in the, in the a gym setting, people just grab the dumbbells and just go crazy on the little lateral raise. This is the correct way of doing it, is that you come up into that nice top position and then you lean forward. So you're gonna keep constant tension on the deltoids at all times when you do it this way. So there you have it guys, that is the Vince Gironda seated lateral raise. All right guys, now I'm gonna show the, the high bench row. Now this is the actual high bench from Vince's gym, along with the actual dumbbells. And the bench has to be at least 22 inches high because you wanna be able to get your arms, so I can put my arms down fully uh, extended without them being bent or crushed at the bottom here. And so what you wanna do with this particular exercise, this works the entire back. Now, we wanna start with the dumbbells underneath the bench and then we're gonna pull up. And as you pull up, you're actually gonna lift your legs up too until you're coming up. The reason why you lift your legs is because you're also hitting the end points down where the lats are actually connected down into the sacrum. And so as you're pulling yourself up, you're gonna engage the entire uh, back. And so this is a complete back exercise. So it looks like this. So you wanna exhale as you come up and then, and then you raise your legs up. <laughs> And when you pull up, you're coming up so that the, the dumbbells are parallel to each other on this one. So there is another version of this exercise, and this is other volumes, where you would actually come up and you'd raise the dumbbells out to the side so you flare them out. You come up and you pull back in. The other version of the high bench row, but for volume two, we're just gonna pull up, keeping the dumbbells facing each other. Elbows at right angles up, and you come right up. And you wanna be able to lift the legs and the head as you come up. Just like that. And guys, that is the high bench row. All right guys, now I'm gonna show the dumbbell kickback or the mule kickback. Sometimes it's uh, called that in Vince's literature. Um, so you're gonna grab two dumbbells now the, the key to this exercise is to get down nice and low and then to kick the arms up like a, like a mule would, would kick, I guess. So you wanna get down, you wanna get down nice and low so the dumbbells are gonna start at the front deltoid and then we're gonna get some power here and we're gonna throw them right up. Now when we go up, we want the elbows to, to kick up and get up nice and high so we can get that full extension. So as you're coming up with your butt and your, as your legs extend, your arms will extend at the same time. So you get down here, and then you're gonna come up and exhale. So you don't wanna just be going like this. We wanna get that motion 
get some momentum, and then exhale and get those arms up. So it looks like this. So you take a deep breath in, like get into that nice, lo nice and low position. So the key to this exercise, again, establish that, that low position with the dumbbells touching the front deltoids. And then as we go back, we get the leg extension, the hips up, and you tip. Your shoulders come down slightly, and you get the arms, elbows up, getting that nice full extension as you come up. That one takes a lot out of you. Guys, that is a dumbbell tricep kickback. All right, guys, now I'm going to show you the dumbbell preacher curl. Now, it works best on this type of a preacher bench. This is the one that I got from Larry Scott. Um, I do own the original uh, Vince's Gym preacher bench. I have that in my museum video um, that you can check that out. So I like to do the dumbbell preacher curl on Larry's bench because he has this, um, his is a little different, where it kind of angles down here, so you can, you can really get this, uh, this leverage point that you can put your elbows right into the pad. So there's some other preacher benches, the, the ones you see in the gyms, and they're straight down, they're hard, and they, they angle down about, uh, about a 70 degree angle, and they're very hard on your elbows because you start grinding your elbows into those pads and it just really hurts. Um, those are kind of designed so you have to kind of get down nice and low. And the nice thing about this bench is that it, if when you do your barbell work or your, your low dumbbell work, you can be down in here and the elbows stay off the pad so you don't grind your elbows. But for the dumbbell preacher curl, what we want to do is you want to keep your elbows <coughs> pressed up here at the high point of the bench and then you lean back. Now, even though Larry's bench has a seat, he would never use that. That's actually more designed to put the barbell down so you can grab it and then come up. So Larry would perform all of his exercises on this side of the bench, and I prefer that. And so you put your elbows in, and you would lean back, and so you get the stretch in the bicep, and then you, you curl the dumbbells up. As you're curling, you're going to point the, the pinkies up. So you're getting more of a supination here as you're going up. And so you come up, you supinate, and you contract, and then come down. So this is what it looks like with dumbbells. So you put your elbows here, about just a little bit uh, shoulder, a little bit past shoulder width apart. And so you come down here, and then we're going to curl. So down but on the low end, you want to let the dumbbells roll down the fingers. And we're going to curl the dumbbells, and then we're going to pull up and you're gonna turn the dumbbells into that supinated position all the way to the deltoids. And then you come down, you just lean back a little bit, you roll the dumbbells down the fingertips, you come curl the wrist, and then you curl up. <sighs> you lean toward the dumbbells as you come up with the dumbbells, down, come up. You lean back here, stretch, <sighs> and then contract, trying to touch the dumbbells to the shoulders here. Go down, you're gonna turn the pinkies up. <sighs> squeeze, and then come down, lean back, stretch, roll the dumbbell down the fingers, curl, exhale, supinate, touch the deltoids, and come back down. <sighs> squeeze, <sighs> inhale, exhale. <sighs> Squeeze, inhale, slow back, exhale. Come down nice and slow for the negative. So 
So the key points here, guys, when you're coming, when you're coming back down, you're gonna lean back just a little bit to get the stretch in the bicep. And then as you curl, you can let the dumbbell roll down the hands, curl the wrist as you come up. You're gonna start to turn the pinkies up. You're gonna sort of go leaning into the movement, contract, touch the dumbbells to the shoulders, and then come back really slow, separating, leaning back. And guys, that is the dumbbell preacher curl. Now guys, I wanna show you the seated wrist curl. Now in volume one, there are a couple of variations of the wrist curl that I already demonstrated. This is another version of a wrist curl that Vince would, would teach us. And this was in the volume two. And this is a little bit different, um, not too much different than the last volume, except for we're gonna do it seated. And you're gonna do them on your knees. So you're gonna start with the dumbbells rolled down the fingers. And then you're gonna <coughs> kinda lean back a little bit so you can stretch the, the forearms. And then as you curl up, you're going to go into a lean position toward the dumbbells, and then you're gonna bring your pinkies up. So you're turning your hands in as you are coming up. So you exhale, and you inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale, Inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale, and then inhale. So this is a little different than what we did last month, except for the only difference is that when you come up, you're turning your pinkies up, it's creating like almost a V shape. So you come up, you exhale, and you're turning your pinkies up, so you can get more supination on the, the forearm flexors here. So you're coming up and you can really get a tight contraction. The key is when you go down to roll the dumbbell down the fingers, and then you roll back up, you curl, wrist curl, and then you lean into it, contract. And then as you're going down, you're leaning back just a slight bit so that you can get a stretch in the forearms. And then you exhale, you come up, and you hold that tight contraction one to two seconds, and then you come back down. Guys, that is the seated dumbbell wrist curl. All right, guys, now I'm gonna show you the reverse body drag. Now, you wanna use a straight bar, and this is, in, this is the four foot bar. You can use it with the big Olympic bar as well, but this is easier to maneuver with. So you wanna start with your heels together, toes flared, knees slightly bent. The bar is gonna start on your thighs. Now the key is, is we wanna drag this bar all the way up to our chin without losing contact with the bar on the body. So you want your arms to be just a little bit past shoulder width. This will allow you free mobility to go all the way up and down without being constricted. So it looks like this, we're gonna look down and I want you to pull your elbows back Keep the bar in contact with your body at all times. Come all the way up to your chin, and then come all the way back down on the inhale. Exhale as you come up, pulling the elbows back, keeping the bar on your body at all times, and then come back down. Exhale. Inhale as you come down. Exhale, pull the elbows back. Inhale. Exhale. And inhale. Now the key points on this one is you wanna keep the bar in contact with the body as it travels all the way up and down. And then you wanna pull the elbows back and keep them in. You don't want to flare them out. I've seen some people that go up and they'll start to lose contact, but their elbows will just flare out and that, that will ruin the motion. So you want to come up, elbows back, and then keep them really tight to the body and come all the way up to the chin and back down. Now, on this particular exercise, you don't want to use the false grip. 
that I've talked about in the last volume. You want to keep the thumb on the opposite side of the fingers when you do forearm work because we're going to isolate the brachioradialis, which is sort of that knot that is on the forearm, and it, it really brings out the forearm definition, and it really ties in with the bicep. So this particular exercise, you, know, you don't need a ton of weight. You can go up and you'll really feel a tremendous burn in the brachioradialis just from using just the bar. And so you want to really master that before you actually increase your weight. But once you get to this point where you've got that motion down, it becomes a lot more fun and you can add more weight to it. And guys, that is the reverse body drag. Hi right, guys, now I'd like to show you the Dellinger squat. Now, this particular exercise, it's a great exercise. It can be very challenging. So I always suggest that you always start with very light weight. Um, sometimes I'll have my students just use just a, a, uh, a wooden dowel just to do this exercise because it's, it demands a lot of focus and concentration because it's a little bit different than a back squat or just a regular front squat because what you're doing is you're, you're trying to keep your back as straight as possible throughout the entire range of motion. And that's where it becomes a, more of a challenge. Now, unfortunately, my demonstration is not going to be perfect. I um, broke my leg last year skiing, and so I have a lot of nerve damage in my leg, and I, I just don't have the neural drive um, that I, that I re that's required for this particular exercise. And so I'm just going to use a light weight, and I'm going to do the best I can. Um, I, I can't get all the way down like I used to, and um, I'm working on it. Someday I'll get back there. But for the demonstration, um, I, it might not be my best. So, but I'll give you all the key points. So the, so the first thing you're going to do is you're going to stand on a 2 by 4 and you're gonna, your feet are going to be 12 inches apart. You're going to grab the bar, you're going to put it up onto your front deltoids here. <coughs> Arms up, don't drop them, keep them up. Now you're going to keep your back nice and straight. Now the key to this exercise, again, is keeping the back straight. And unfortunately, I can't go all the way down, but you'll get the idea. And so you're going to go down, keep your back straight. And you go down. Oh, yeah, and coming up. So unfortunately, I can't go any lower than that. But um, that's the idea. You're going down, keeping the back straight. You want to get down to almost like about a 90 degree position. And then you stand back up. So I'll give it a, another go here. So again, arms up, looking straight ahead, keep the back straight, putting the tension in the quadriceps. That's about all I can get, and right back up. And so ideally, you want to go all the way down, much further than that. But the key is keeping the back straight. Now, if you can't do that, even with the light weight, and you find that you're still going into anterior flexion of the spine, then what you can do is a modified version of that and you use a bench and this this works well so this is what I've been doing to for rehab as well as um, getting stronger to develop the actual movement for the Dellinger squat so you sit on a bench and what this does it allows you to create just a little bit more momentum so that you can stand up a little bit easier so you go from here and then you you're going to stand up. So you go down, and then stand up, keeping your back nice and straight. So first you want to do it with your feet on the floor until you master it. And then you can use your two, uh, your, your two by four to sort of mimic the same thing that we did freestanding. And so what you do is just put your feet, heels on the board, and then you keep your arms crossed, and then you stand up. So... Again, you're trying to keep your back straight, and so this is preparing you to do it on the freestanding Dillinger squat. So that's just a great modified version of the exercise, and by working on the bench, it allows you to develop the strength in the correct form, and then eventually you can go off and do it freestanding. Um, if you're strong enough already, and you can master this without having to do the modified, then that's, that's where you want to be, especially for volume two, is teaching you to keep that nice, perfect form. So guys, just some key points. 
standard of two by four, 12 inches apart. And you want to keep your back straight, keep the bar up on the, on the deltoids, elbows up high, go down 90 degrees, then come back up. It's a concentrated exercise, so just use light weight to begin with. And I do apologize. Um, I wish I could have demonstrated perfectly like I used to um, on this one. I love this exercise, but I'm working my way back up to it. But right now, I just don't have the, the neural drive in my leg to, to really demonstrate perfect form. But the idea is you want to go to that 90 degree position, keeping that back nice and straight, and then standing back up. So there you have it, guys. That is the Dellinger squat. All right, guys, so this is a seated calf raise. Now, the seated calf raise is going to work the soleus muscle group. It's, a, it's the, the muscle group that is underneath the gastrocnemius, which is that beautiful diamond-shaped calf muscle. And then underneath it is the soleus. But the soleus is important because that, that develops a really nice foundation of the calf. And it also kind of helps kind of give that nice uh, thick size to the calf um, and, that's, and more strength to the calf. So this is the seated calf raise. Now it's the same idea as the standing calf, uh, toe raise, is that we want to focus on, our, on the pressure on our toes. And how we do that is when you disengage here, um, you, don't want to, you don't want to ever raise up onto your small toes when you come up. We want to put all the pressure on the big toes. So it's the same idea as when we did the, the standing toe raise, is that when you go down, you want, to, you want to spread the feet so that you get the stretch on the calf, but then as you come up, you want to push up and you want to transfer the resistance from your small toe all the way through the other toes and then ending up onto the big toe as you are turning in your heels to touch them together. So you go up and you come back down. You want to stretch and you come all the way up, go up onto the big toe and you're pulling in your heels together trying to touch the heels together and you lean forward and get as much contraction as possible and then you come back down, you can go back into a recline position then you exhale, you come over the bar leaning forward and pressing your heels together really tight and then come back down and you exhale, you come up and really get that tight contraction onto the big toe inhale and exhale and hold that for one to two seconds and that's what you want to do so again we're doing a little bit more isolation on the calf by bringing the tension from your small toes to the big toe and then reversing that as you're coming down for the stretch. So you're going to stretch the calf and then you come up, you're going to go up and put all your pressure onto the big toe and that's going to naturally pull your heels in together so you get a really strong contraction in the calves. Guys, that is the seated calf raise. All right guys, now I'm going to show you a very unique exercise. This is the decline bench dumbbell leg curl. This is one you don't really see a lot in gyms. Um, but Vince liked, liked this one a lot, and it's one that he used to do all the time at his gym. And this is the actual decline bench from Vince's gym that I'll be demonstrating the exercise on. Now, this one's a little tricky. Um, it's hard to kind of get into. Sometimes it's best to have somebody to help you when you put the dumbbell on. Um, so I'll try to do my best to don't kill myself. But <laughs> so it looks like this. You want to lie down. And then you're going to put the dumbbell in between your feet. And then you're going to curl up the dumbbell, trying to touch the hamstrings. So you're holding on to the dumbbell. Inhale as you extend. Exhale as you curl. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. And come back down. Now the cool thing about this bench, when you do that exercise, is that you can hold on. So this was a great idea so that you can hold on, kind of pull yourself into it. Um, otherwise, just hold on to the side of the bench. Now, it's actually very difficult for me because of my leg. I'm not able to get full range of motion on this particular exercise. I did the best I could. And also, I have no, I have no feeling in my knee. So um, 
it's just difficult for me to do this one. But the idea is to curl all the way up, and you would actually touch your hamstrings with the dumbbell. It's a little tricky to negotiate to get the dumbbell on your feet. That's why it's best to have somebody kind of help support you. And they can actually kind of spot you as you do this exercise, especially with heavy weight, to kind of help keep the dumbbell between your feet. But when you're holding the dumbbell, that's going to activate the inner hamstrings. And then when you curl up, you're going to hit the other two aspects of the hamstring. So it's a great exercise. It's one to get sort of used to. But once you get used to it, it becomes a great exercise. And um, it's just something different than just doing the regular, normal leg curl on a machine. So give it a try, guys. It has to be on a decline bench. And um, any decline bench will work. This one happens to work out really well because, again, I can have my arms kind of holding on. And I can pull up. So it's a great idea, and it's kind of fun to do. Guys, that is the decline bench dumbbell leg curl. All right, guys, now I'm going to show you what's the heavy walk-offs. Now, this one can actually be done on a, on a, a conventional uh, standing uh, calf raise machine, the one that has the pads. And you can go up and down. That's a great, great machine. Um, or you can do it on a Smith machine. So Vince always preferred doing all calf work without shoes on. And the reason for that is because you, with, with shoes, they sort of limit your range of motion, especially the, the thicker and the more, um, if it's like a cross trainer or a thick shoe like that, there, there's hardly any range of motion that you can get. Um, if you have soft shoes like moccasins and things like that, that will work. But ideally, you want to do all calf work with, uh, in your bare feet. And so this is the heavy walk-off. Now, if you're doing it on a Smith machine, you want the calf block to be just a little bit past the, the actual bar, so almost about six to eight inches back, and that will allow you to get in the, a good stretch position. And so what you do is you get on the block, and then you're going to drop your left foot down while you bend your right knee so you're into this position. So you get this stretch, and then you're going to go up onto your left foot, and then you're going to switch. So you kind of, it would almost be like if you have ever seen Michael Jackson, it's almost like moonwalking, I guess. So you go down, and then you exhale. And so you come up to meet at the top. So as one's going down, the other's going up. And I want you to go up on your big toe. And so the key to that exercise is as one foot's going down, the other foot is staying up. You're going to cross in the middle there. So you're going to go up with one foot as one's going down. So you're kind of keeping this synchronized pattern as you're getting a good stretch on one foot. You're getting really good contraction on the other. And so this particular exercise allows for a different uh, position or intensity on the calf than doing them both together. So it just a, it kind of breaks up the monotony of always doing just a regular standard calf raise. And you can kind of get into the movement as you're going along, and you can really get a, a tremendous pump off the calves. And this will help develop the gastrocnemius muscle and really bring out that, that diamond-shaped calf. And guys, that is the standing heavy walk-off calf raise. So there you have it, guys. Those are the exercises for volume two of the Master Series. Now, again, if you don't have the book and you'd like to get a copy, you can go on my website at www.darylcurrent.com. You can grab a copy there. Or you can go on Amazon.com. If you have any questions about my books or my products, you can email me. You can find my email on my website as well. Guys, I want to thank you very much for watching. See you next time.